Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Lighter Designs. Now, on this channel, we've already looked at some of the incredible sets and models that went into James Cameron's Titanic film from 1997. The movie cleverly used a mix of huge scale sets and beautifully detailed miniatures to recreate the ship's life and death. Now, this all culminated in what the crack visual effects team called the million dollar shot, involving an enormous 45 foot long model of the ship. But that shot was easy work compared to the monumental task of shooting miniatures for the sinking sequences, when Titanic has to go through various stages of destruction after meeting that fateful iceberg. There are actually quite a few miniatures used for this, some you've probably seen in action before, and others you probably haven't. Here is the remarkable story of the miniatures used for the sinking scenes from Titanic. Today we'll look at four specific moments from the film and see how miniatures were used to bring those moments to life. First, Titanic's impact with the iceberg. Second, the ship's gradual sinking. Third, the ship's breakup, and lastly, the violent final plunge to the sea floor. Now, James Cameron is a director known for pushing himself and his crew to the very limit in order to achieve technological brilliance in their films. It meant that Titanic would harness cutting edge visual effects technology from the late 1990s to make the ship look absolutely real. But because the technology was in its infancy, Cameron and his team would have to also rely on tried and true cinema techniques for many of the shots. Miniatures have been used in Titanic movies for over a century, but they've been fairly unconvincing. Usually too small and shot in real water, the audience can tell what they're seeing is a miniature. This is true of most movies from the 40s through to the 70s if they ever involve water. Shot at a high frame rate and slowed right down, the water droplets and effects are just too big to seem real. Cameron and his VFX team had a monumental task ahead. To avoid making their film look like a 50s B-movie by improving on those classic Hollywood techniques and implementing liberal usage of computer-generated effects to sell the whole thing. If it sounds easy, it certainly wasn't. First, the team had to figure out how to depict probably the most iconic moment from the Titanic sinking. That's when the Titanic first strikes the iceberg. This fateful encounter had been portrayed dozens of times before on the big screen and on TV, and always in the same way, with vague suggestions of a collision or with stock footage of an iceberg tinted to make it look like nighttime. 1997's Titanic had to be the most convincing depiction of the encounter yet, and pretty early on the team realised that bigger miniatures were the best way to shoot action scenes because they scaled well against actual water. For the million dollar shot, the model didn't need to be that big. Yes, it was 45 feet long, but that was just for the purposes of getting realistic details onto it and lighting effects that would look realistic. It wasn't big enough to shoot in a real water tank though. Even at 45 feet in length, the water wouldn't be scaled correctly and it'd look fake like in the old Titanic movies. Instead, for the hero shot in the film, the 45 foot long model was put onto a digital ocean which was made up entirely of computer generated visual effects composited onto each other. The team couldn't do this for the sinking scenes though. Titanic would need to interact with the water as it slipped beneath the waves and the computer graphics weren't advanced enough to fake it. The miniatures for the sinking scenes would need to be shot in water tanks and because they would be in real water, they would need to be big. Really, really big. Now before we go on, I just have to tell you about a great documentary that I've been watching from today's sponsor, Magellan TV. Now see, back in the 1960s when the SS France, one of the greatest ocean liners ever built, was completed, she was the absolute pride of her nation. An incredible ocean liner for the modern age. She served for years with French Line and found a second life as the cruise ship Norway. But did you know there is actually a plan in place to design and build a new France for the 21st century? Well, I didn't, but on Magellan TV, I found an amazing documentary about the ship. Magellan TV is a hidden jewel among streaming services jammed full of brilliant and informative documentaries. I've been watching content about the new France, airships, history, you name it. I can't put the app down, it's great. It's the best value premium documentary streaming service in price and quality and the highest rated documentary streaming app in Google Play. How cool is that? And it's no wonder Magellan TV just does documentaries the right way. It's all about the drama of real life, the lives of pharaohs, critical battles in World War I and World War II, the Norman Conquest, ships, Magellan TV has the largest and best collection of history shows anywhere. They add 20 hours of new content every week. 20 hours every week. So you'll never catch up. It's incredible. 4K quality is included in your subscription by default. I can attest to this. The documentaries look beautiful. But the best part of all is, unlike this video, there are no ads. Ever. 
Follow the link in the description of this video and get a free 30 day trial of the service and catch some truly excellent quality programming. I'd recommend starting with the documentary SS France A Cruise Legend Returns. Let me know in the comments if you think the project will ever see the light of day. I just don't know. I hope so. It's kind of cool. Now, back to the Titanic. For the iceberg collision sequence, a massive iceberg model was built along with a section of Titanic's bow made of lead plate on a frame. The moment the iceberg is sighted from the Titanic used a miniature of the iceberg too, shot on a green screen with the bow of Titanic green screened on front from one of the models, most likely the 45 foot long hero model, which was the most detailed. The iceberg collision sequence was different though. This would have to be violent and impactful. And the plan was simple. Visual effects supervisor Rob Legato explains, we had a pickup truck in the parking lot pulling a one quarter inch cable, which went in through the stage door, up through pulleys, then connected to the underwater dolly the iceberg rode on because nothing was strong enough to yank this thing at high speed and actually pierce this metal hull we built. Our camera, which was shooting at 48 FPS, was riding in an underwater camera housing with the iceberg as it impacted the hull. Eric Nash, the director of photography, highlighted the problems encountered by the team while working on this shot with real water. He said, water is such a pain in the butt. We had to keep the water clear, but not too clear, and keep the bubbles off the iceberg because as soon as it started to move, the bubbles would give away the scale. Then when the iceberg split the seams and the lead plates on the hull, Jim, James Cameron, wanted to see chunks of ice splintering and falling off. So we were working with this elaborate iceberg that was rigged to break apart, but which had to look like one piece before it hit the hull. Consequently, the model shop had to re-sculpt the iceberg for each take and mask all the cracks where it would break on impact. Lastly, we were photographing an event that took place on a moonless night, so we had to take some creative license. In reality, it was pitch black out there. We had to light the scene so the audience could see what was going on, but it couldn't look lit or look like it was daylight above water because we had to cut above water in our next shot. The next shot shows water pouring in through a gash ripped into the Titanic's hull plating, and this was done with a Model 2, a one quarter scale model of the ship's cargo hold shot in the parking lot of the studio at nighttime. Eric Nash recalled that, To create the effect of water bursting through the hull at high pressure, Mark Knoll built three fire hoses into a manifold resembling a mail slot so that we could focus the water to hit the exact spot on the outside of the miniature set. The actual interior walls on Titanic were made up of overlapping steel plates, so the model shop replicated these plates in soft lead. When the water, which was pouring through the manifold at 10 gallons a second, hit the outside of this miniature cargo hold, it ripped the seam in the lead plating and burst into the set. All of this is shot at a high frame rate, 40 frames per second or higher. This is because when played back at the movie's actual frame rate, 24 frames per second, the events on screen are slowed down and it gives them a sense of scale and realism. The final sequence was beautifully done and it meant that for some time, few miniature effects would be needed. Cameron had built a massive set of the ship over 700 feet long designed to sink and look as realistic as possible. I covered that in my first video in this series, but there were some shots the set couldn't be used for specifically the close-ups on the bow as the ship begins to sink below the water. The set in Mexico was absolutely huge, but only featured the Titanic from about the bridge down. For shots of the ship beginning to slip beneath the waves, a huge 1 6 scale section of Titanic's bow was recreated in large miniature form, and to a very high degree of accuracy and realism, it was shot in a tank. You can see it in action in these shots here, and most noticeably here as the Titanic's well deck begins to flood towards the end of the sinking. Most of the sinking scenes from the outside used shots of the incredible set, but the set could only do so much. It could be tilted downwards up to 8 degrees, but couldn't be used for the breakup and final plunge. For that, models would need to be used, and just like in the iceberg sequence, they would need to be big. Really big. For the breakup and final plunge, a one quarter scale model was used to represent the very stern of the ship. Another larger model, the 1 8 scale miniature of Titanic from about the third funnel down, would be used to depict wider shots of the break up and plunge. This thing was huge too, absolutely dwarfing the 45 foot long 120 scale hero model. But here's an interesting fact. The 120 scale hero model was by far the most detailed model of the ship, so it would be used for close ups of the sinking as the stern is lifted high out of the water. It was cut almost in half, just aft or behind of the second funnel and mounted on a cradle to rise high into the air at about 45 degrees. This model was used for shots like this where the detail would need to be sufficient to appear on camera. Now today the model is on display in one piece in Los Angeles and it's a little bit difficult to spot but if you look carefully you can just make out where the two sections of the ship were put back together. In this clip you can see the decking has been patched here 
and in this frame you can see that there's a clear line where the hull plates don't line up. The 1 8th model was different though, it would need to be able to break up just like the real thing and be patched for multiple takes. Then it would need to plunge realistically into the ocean as the stern was dragged underwater. It meant that unlike the hero model, the breakup model would not be expected to survive shooting. First, the 1 8th scale model was used to depict Titanic as the stern begins to rise up out of the water, showing the propellers. This was all shot in a tank with real water. Rob Legato explains, We put our 1 8th scale stern on a hydraulic rig, and as it was lifted out of the water, we shot the props rising out of the ocean at high speed, around 60 to 72 frames per second, which became the background for the rowboats and people swimming. So in the movie, all throughout the sinking scenes, different shots and cuts will use models or full-size sets interchangeably. Here's a quick breakdown of just a short 50 seconds or so of one whole sinking sequence. Essentially, any far shots of the stern rising used the 120 scale hero model cut in half, and the water had to be added digitally and faked. You can tell if you zoom in on this shot of the sinking that it kind of fades over the Titanic's deck and doesn't look entirely convincing under close scrutiny. Of course, the people were added later digitally, animated by motion capture, using dozens of stunt performances. And then there came the most dramatic moment of the sinking, the breakup. For this, the 1 8 scale model was used. A section of the ship forward of the breakup area was built too, but not a lot of it because it would be invisible beneath the water. The two sections were joined together with soft lead plating again that was expected to deform and tear in a realistic way when the hull, which was raised and held at a 45 degree angle, had its supports removed. Then came the breakup. Rob Legato explained, Mark's guys had to support the 1 8 scale stern just back of the breaking point at a 45 degree angle, then let it go. When the ship broke, the hydraulic rig dropped the stern in the water and made a huge splash. The ship's hull hitting the ocean had to appear immensely powerful. Cameron's brief was that it should look like God's boot heel was crushing down on the people in the water. It was shot at 70 frames per second to capture every detail in slow motion as the stern dropped down and created a monstrous wave. The shot looks really good because it was filmed from flattering angles with quick cuts. But it's here, if you freeze, that you'll notice the water droplets are way too big and it's clearly a miniature in action. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not pointing out these flaws to denigrate or criticise the movie unnecessarily. I absolutely love these practical effects. They don't really make movies like this anymore very often. But by pointing out the very few imperfections, it gives you an idea of how the shots were composed in the first place and shows how the whole thing was put together. Finally came time for the ship's final plunge. For this, the 1 8th scale model was mounted at 90 degrees and would be dragged under into a pool with cameras mounted at various angles. But the tank couldn't be so deep as to allow for the whole model to sink in one take over and over again, so instead it would be sunk for a section at a time, then raised and about 10 feet of the model would be cut off. The process was repeated again and again until only the very tip of the ship's stern and the propellers were left. The shots shown from the main character's viewpoint from atop the rail were accomplished by filming the stern set tilted to 90 degrees against a green screen. The ship scene forward of this is variously the 1 8th scale model disappearing beneath the water, or the 1 20th scale hero model up in the air. Finally, as the very end of the ship begins to go under, the quarter scale stern model was used because the size of its detail matched perfectly with the full size set in Mexico. The 1 6th bow section, the 1 8th and quarter scale stern sections were all made masterfully by both Cameron's visual effects team at Digital Domain and the team of legendary studio model maker Don Pennington. Now while the hero model remains stitched back together and intact on display in Los Angeles, there's nothing really left of the 1 6th, 1 8th or 1 quarter scale models. After the movie was finished, Cameron kept the hero model but the rest of the props and model remnants were left behind for any of the crew to take in souvenir. Presumably anything left behind was broken up for scrap. I've seen a few interesting items pop up for auction though. Here's a green winch from the 1 6th scale bow section actually signed by model maker Don Pennington. There's also this anchor, most likely also from the 1 6th scale bow section. Here's a deck vent which came up for auction, it's from the 1 8th scale breakup and final plunge model. And here's a section from one of the stern models showing the railing and iconic propeller notice warning sign. Definitely the coolest piece I found from the 1 8th model though is this intact funnel. The thing's 40 inches or 100 centimetres tall. I look great right in the corner of my office over there, but uh, 
Unfortunately, it went under the hammer at auction and sold for 10,000 British pounds, or 12,000 US dollars. Better luck next time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please think about liking and subscribing to the channel. You can support my channel on Patreon. You'll find the link down in the description. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.